Good Wednesday afternoon. I'm Dr. Martha Buchanan, Public Health Officer and Senior Director of the Knox County Health Department. Our moment of gratitude today is for our environmental health team who along with doing the standard part of their jobs, inspecting businesses that are permitted by KCHD, are also still following up on complaints and providing education to businesses regarding reopening guidance and how to safely do that. Uh, we are thankly, thankful for their hard work during this time and for balancing several different responsibilities. Additionally, we'd like to thank 311, our internal business reopening team, the county constituent services team, and our community partners who are also providing valuable assistance as it relates to answering reopening questions from the public. Moving on to our local situation. We have 366 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Knox County. Additionally, we have 10 probable cases. 313 of the cases have recovered. 40 individuals have been hospitalized at some time in their illness. Currently, only two Knox County residents are hospitalized. We are also thankful that we have no additional deaths due to COVID-19 related complications. Again today, we are seeing a statistically significant increase in cases. Um, after further reviewing the data, we need to correct what we said yesterday. Because of the increases, we were also at a red light yesterday and the day before. This just means it's more of a statistically significant increase. However, we are continuing to respond effectively. We are beginning the process of bringing KCHD team members back in or uh, from the jobs they've been doing to support contact tracing. As we mentioned, we would, we would be doing all along. We will update the benchmarks and the respective traffic lights on Friday and review all of them at that time. However, because this is the first time we are experiencing a shift, we wanted to provide some information for you today. As we mentioned yesterday, we do expect to see an, we do expect to see an increase in our cases as the community reopens. A few of these cases are related to two small clusters. We are continuing to keep an eye on this, and as always, we'll continue to investigate new cases. In the in the same that same vein. We've received several questions about clusters. As a note of practice, we don't talk about the details regarding specific cases unless there's a public health reason to make a notification to the public. As of right now, there is no such need. I'll open it up for questions. All right, you can submit your questions into the chat feature now. And as a reminder, please type in your name and the media outlet that you're with as well. Uh, first question is from Paul with WBIR. Another day with a big jump in cases, 14. At what point does Knox County look at going back to phase one? And is that needed? So like we've said all along, one benchmark is not what we're going to use to determine moving forward or moving backward. We're going to use all of those pieces of information that we, we've talked about, case increases, hospital preparedness, our own internal preparedness, testing, uh, capacity, and uh, deaths of COVID. So we're going to look at all of those things together and also look at the context of the increase in cases. Um, we expected an increase in cases, uh, so we're not surprised by this. And another really important thing is that our case count has been so low. We've only been getting a few cases a day. Um, it doesn't take much to be statistically significant. So if you go from a couple of cases a day up to five or 10, that's, that makes a big difference. And so with our cases being so low, we're not alarmed. We're going to continue to watch this. I think it's a reminder to our community of the important role each one of us plays and whether or not we as a community can move forward. We need to keep practicing those five things, wearing a mask, social distancing, staying home if you're sick, um, and now washing your hands regularly and cleaning surfaces. All of those things need to be continue to be done. And if we all do those, we all get to move forward. If we don't, we either have to stay here or even maybe go backwards and we don't want to do that. All right. Megan, I believe that answered your question as well. If it didn't, feel free to type something else into the chat feature. Uh, from Paul with WBIR, he asked, he had a viewer ask about people with autoimmune diseases that come with a chronic fever. If a business scans their temperature and sees that it's above average, will they be turned away? That's a decision that the business will have to make at that point. Um, so I, I, that again, that's a business decision that they make at that point. From Laura with WATE, 
Can you clarify protocol for testing? We've received a lot of questions. Who is eligible for testing and what are the opportunities for testing this week? Okay, um, good question. So I'm gonna start with protocol for testing. Um, so I can only speak to what we're doing for testing and anybody's, uh, anybody getting tested. Um, you don't need to have symptoms. You just need to wanna get tested. Obviously, we are also testing folks who are symptomatic and folks who are connected to cases that become symptomatic. Um, so, you know, to get right now, we're actually changing our process, hopefully to make it a little more user friendly. So right now what you do is you call and you get an hour of time to be at our testing site. It's a drive through site down where the uh, engineering and public works building is. Um, you get an hour of time to arrive and you get there and we put you through the process. Um, we are also right now trying to collect some insurance information so that we can bill people's insurance. Um, I know uh, everybody here's testing is free and we're not charging individuals for testing. However, the testing isn't free. It has to be paid for. The county is covering some of that cost. In order to cover some more of that cost, we're trying to bill some insurance. Um, again, no, no charge to the person, but billing insurance that you've already paid for. Um, who will pay for that testing will enable the county to not have to pay, have such a big bill to pay for all that testing. So uh, again, we want test testing to be free. When I, when I talk about other, other providers, I don't know what their protocols are. Those are individual by provider. Um, they use their clinical decision-making or it might be based on how many supplies they have or how much access to uh, a laboratory they have and other things. Um, so I can talk to our, and so, from our standpoint, excuse me, from our standpoint, we'll be testing today and Friday at our drive through site. Thursday is reserved for outreach testing, and I believe we are going to do some outreach testing on Thursday. Uh, from a WBLT viewer via Megan, uh, when will it be safe to allow people to visit nursing homes again? Well, wow, that's going to be quite a ways out. Um, that is determined by several different things. Uh, the Center for Medi Medicare and uh, Medicaid sent out some guidance recently. Uh, one of the benchmarks that they mentioned is they want all nursing homes across the country to have a baseline of testing done. As you've heard us talk about, the state is in the process of accomplishing that task. Uh, Knox County is playing a supporting role in, in getting that done. Uh, but as you can imagine, that'll take some time. They want that baseline to be there. Uh, before they even make a, a, a step forward into opening those facilities up. And again, the reason they're staying closed is those folks we know are the most vulnerable people to die from complications of COVID-19. From Scott with Compass, can you speak to the clusters in general terms? Are they related to businesses or churches or neighborhoods? Um, so th the clusters are related to a combination of things and um, we are able to, one's related to a business, one's related to, and I'm drawing a blank on that one. Um, so I'm sorry, um, I, we can get that, sorry, Scott, we can get that back for you. I'm just, I'm, I apologize. So um, what's happening though, is that those facilities, those organizations that are involved are cooperating with us. They're giving us the information that we need. They're um, helping us uh, locate folks that might be at risk and we've been able to reach out to the folks who are at risk or are in process of reaching out to them. So that negates the need for public notification. From Brian Hornback, uh, social media postings yesterday were speculating that a local brochure may not have responded to a small cluster. Is that true? I'm not sure what you're speaking of. We have had great cooperation from everybody that we've had to work clusters with. Uh, from Vincent uh, from the Sentinel, how far beyond the red line did the case increase get and how significant was the increase? Um, we'll have to get back with you with that specific question um, uh, Look and look at our calculations. Also from Vincent with the Sentinel, um, what was the cause of the correction? Was that an error in your calculations or were you working with incomplete data? Um, again, I don't have that. I was just advised that it, there was an adjustment made. Uh, we can uh, get back to you with any specifics regarding that. Uh, from WBLT via Megan, does phase two mean that quarantine is over? Uh, no, quarantine will continue um, as long as we have COVID-19. Um, so quarantine is a tool that public health uses to take folks who've potentially been exposed to an illness ask them to stay home and watch and wait to see if they get sick. 
So I think it's, this is an opportunity to bring something up. People are being told by doctors that if they get a test and it's negative, they can come out of quarantine. That is not true. We've spoken frequently about the fact that a test is a moment in time and you can be positive or negative now, positive tomorrow. So if you're asked to stay in quarantine, um, we need you to stay in quarantine the whole 14 days. So with every infectious disease, there's a quarantine period. That quarantine period is the incubation period for that illness. So you get exposed to the disease on this day, we want you to stay in quarantine for 14 days. And why is that? It's because we don't want you to be out possibly exposing other people and possibly causing other cases. This is how we in public health and how you can help us break the chain of transmission. So we have a case, we have people who got exposed to them. All those people are asked to stay in quarantine. And when they do that, we break the chain of transmission. Anybody who's potentially a new case isn't going out and making other people sick. So it's really important part of us as a community being able to move forward and not having to stay here or even go backward. Um, uh, complying with quarantine is hard and it's no fun to have to stay home for two weeks, but it's so important for everybody to do. From Paul with WBIR, is KCHD working with businesses to make sure small clusters don't become a bigger cluster? That exactly what I just talked about. So when we have a cluster at a business, we actually have to ask a lot of people to stay in quarantine. Um, and actually sometimes it'll, it'll cause the business to, to have challenges with uh, staffing. Um, and so there's some ways we can work with those businesses. Uh, essential workers are able while in quarantine to work with a mask with more, more stringent guidance. Um, but um, we do work with businesses and place people in quarantine to reduce the risk that a small cluster becomes a big cluster. Another question from Paul with WBIR, should people be at all concerned about shopping at a store where there is or was a small cluster? Um, you know, I think what people need to do more than be concerned about that particular location is to continue to observe the five principles that we've talked about. Wearing a mask, um, social distancing, staying home if you're sick, washing your hands regularly and frequently, um, and cleaning surfaces regularly and frequently. So if you're gonna go shopping, you know, here's my advice. Use some hand sanitizer when you go in, put your mask on, do your shopping, go back out to your car, hand sanitize again, and you should be good. From Brian Hornback, how did you enforce the quarantine on individuals? Well, you know, the really good news is that people are very cooperative. People understand and don't want to make other people sick. So we just simply ask them to stay home. We check on them every day uh, to see if they've developed symptoms, if they have any concerns or questions and continue to educate them. Uh, we can uh, exercise public health uh, law um, and actually use what's called a health directive, which is a letter explaining to them what we need them to do and asking them to do that. And most people, most people uh, cooperate with that and we don't need to go any further. Um, from a viewer uh, via Paul with WBIR, I recently found out I was exposed to an individual who was sick when we were in contact who had tested negative for the swab test, but now says that there was a positive antibody test later on. Should I get an antibody test to see if I was asymptomatic? Antibody tests are not very useful. Antibody tests only tell us that someone was exposed to the illness, doesn't tell us when they were sick, um, doesn't say anything about immunity. Um, so I would not use an antibody test to make any determination about whether you um, had an illness. They're really not for uh, clinical diagnosis at this time, therefore surveillance only. So really not a useful tool on day -to, in day-to-day -day operations at this time. Any other questions? Please go ahead and submit them into the chat feature now. Uh, from Brian Hornback, does a health directive result into a court order or incarceration? <laughs> um, a health directive can potentially result in going before a judge and asking the judge to grant an order to tell somebody to do what we're asking them to do. We use those occasionally when we have people who are non-compliant, say with TB treatment. Um, court orders are re really reserved for cases, so people who are diagnosed with an illness like TB um, uh, or COVID-19. So a confirmed case would be somebody we might uh, have to court order. We haven't had to do that. We rarely have to do that with TB cases but we do have that authority. We do not take it lightly. We understand that that's a, that's a, a big deal to, to ask somebody to do that. Uh, we follow all the guidelines if you, uh, that are outlined in TCA uh, using least restrictive as, as possible to protect the public's health. 
from Tyler with a sentinel. Yesterday, you addressed questions about the revised 12 feet of separation guidelines for exercising and performing. Can you explain further why that is being suggested and where the decision came from? That decision came from um, discussion among our uh, uh, task force. Thank you. Sorry. Um, came from our task force um, discussion and looking at, we know the recommendation for regular everyday activities is six feet. Um, we just said, let's double that because there is good evidence that singing, speaking on stage, exercising all cause you to ex exhale your virus droplets, the droplets with the virus in them further from you than just like I'm talking now. So um, based on that evidence, based on that data, we uh, made that decision to double that distance, um, hoping to increase safety. Also from Tyler with the Sentinel, uh, separately, can you explain why this guideline applies to breath propelled instruments? Studies have shown wind instruments in particular do not project. Um, I, we've seen studies, we, we've looked at data that said different things. So um, the data that we had did say that there's the potential for that to happen. Um, so we use that information. Um, from WVLT, uh, from one of their viewers via Megan, they asked, what should I say to people who may respond negatively to me while I wear a mask in public and follow social distancing guidelines? It's a great question. And um, it kind of goes back to, to what we um, talked about. I guess I'm not sure the particulars uh, of what you're referring to, but we're asking if you don't, if you are one of those people who says, I'm not going to wear a mask, um, show compassion. Um, if you're a person who is wearing a mask, show compassion. Uh, let's be respectful of each other on both sides. Obviously, from our perspective, we really want everybody to wear a mask because we know that's going to increase the chance that we get to move forward. We want to move forward. We don't want to move backward, but we need your help to do that. So we want everybody to be wearing a mask, but we also want everybody to just show some common courtesy and be polite and let people make their own choices. Public health really relies on people to make choices. Uh, right now we're relying on people to make what we believe is the right choice and that's to, to wear a mask. Any other questions, please go ahead and submit them under the chat feature now. All right, since there are no more questions coming in, we appreciate you all joining us and we'll be with you for our media briefing tomorrow. Have a good one.